my background is sort of an unusual one. I studied both computer science and poetry. And so I'm going to take a bit of an interdisciplinary look at the intersection of language and technology about this question of identity. I want to start with a recent story that was on NPR. The story was about a man named Steve Royster. Now, Steve Royster had been having a number of very unusual experiences and confusing experiences on the telephone. They've led him to believe that he had an extremely strange voice. And his reasoning was that everyone always knew when I was calling just by the sound of my voice, while I had no earthly idea who was on the phone when they called. Specifically, Royster has a condition called phone agnosia, or voice blindness. So someone with phone agnosia, they just have absolutely no idea if you're young or old, happy or sad, sarcastic, earnest. Royster, for me, becomes an emblem of where we find ourselves in the 21st century with technology. Because the condition of phone agnosia, you're talking to someone and you don't know who they are, the only means that you have are the words that they're saying. Well, this is the position that essentially everyone finds themselves in on the internet. On this theme of identity, it seems only fitting that we start with one of the most vivid and I think strange cases of identity theft. The date is September 16th, 2008. The presidential campaign is in full swing. A 20-year-old college student named David Cornell decides to try to persuade Yahoo that he's this person, vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin. So he goes and attempts to get into her Yahoo mail account, and of course he doesn't know the password. Now, he's a bit of a hacker, so he could try something like a dictionary attack or a brute force attack, but he finds something much more simple, which is he asks himself the following question. What would Sarah Palin do if Sarah Palin didn't know her own password? Well, she would click the I forgot my password link, at which point Yahoo Mail would prompt you to, quote, verify your identity, unquote, by answering the following three questions. What is your birthday? What is your zip code? Where did you meet your spouse? Cornell finds this information after about 30 minutes of Googling, changes her password to popcorn, and takes a cold shower. Several days later, he's prosecuted for four counts of felony. What I think this example starts to suggest, when it comes to the act of establishing and verifying our identity, Yahoo Mail is certainly asking, I would argue, profoundly the wrong questions. And I'd like to go one step further and argue that so are we. This act conveying our identity of authenticating ourselves, de-anonymizing ourselves to each other, takes place not only online, but it also happens in the real world from person to person. Nowhere perhaps more scarily than in speed dating. Speed dating, as I'm sure many of you are familiar, is this idea of going on a five minute long date where you just really quickly have to try to establish yourself as this unique and distinct individual. And it's, I think, a legitimately difficult problem. People are systematically mistaken in the way that they go about it. And the best example I can give of this is the speed dating scene from Sex in the City, where the Miranda Hobbs character goes on a speed date with a guy named Dwight Owens. Here's how Dwight Owens introduces himself to Miranda on the show. Dwight Owens, private wealth group at Morgan Stanley, investment management for high net worth individuals and a couple pension plans. Like my job, been there five years, divorced, no kids, not religious, live in New Jersey, speak French and Portuguese, Wharton Business School, any of this appealing to you? <laughs> In fact, this is the kind of pitfall. I mean, obviously, they're parodying it, but this is exactly the kind of thing that tends to happen on speed dates. Speed dating, as you may not know, was the invention of a Beverly Hills rabbi named Yaakov Deo, who wanted to set up the folks in his synagogue with each other. What he quickly found out was that people were falling into this Dwight Owens style of speed dating, where they basically just give each other their CV and their resume. And he said, well, that's not really who you are as a person. And so his first act as the speed dating authority was to ban any discussion of your occupation at all. And so what did people do? Well, they fell back on their sort of life history. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Where are you from? Where did you move? And so he had to ban that too. 
And it all starts to point towards this distinction that I want to make between two types of information that you convey about yourself. The first is what I'll call content. This is what Dwight Owens is trying to give to Miranda Hobbs. This is what David Cornell was able to give to Yahoo and claim to be Sarah Palin. Things like a PIN number, a social security number, a password. I mean, Dwight Owens' case, his occupation or his birthplace. Factual, concrete data. In the human world, as the Steve Royster example shows us, we are authenticating people's identities all the time. We're just using different means. And the means that we use in real life are what I want to call form. But if you think about it, signature is the exact opposite of a password. You know ahead of time what word they're going to write. And the emphasis falls on how they write it. You recognize someone often across the room by their gait. It's not the fact that they're walking, but it's the manner in which they walk. Likewise, the way people speak, the prosody, the way their voice rises and falls over a sentence, the timbre of their voice, which is what Steve Royster couldn't use, the way they laugh, not the fact that they're laughing, but the, the way in which they do it. And lastly, their diction and their syntax. It's not the content of their speech, but it's the manner of their speech. What words are they choosing and what order are they putting them in? It's this last point, diction and syntax, that I really want to hone in on, because that's what's going on when Steve Royster talks to his mom, and his mom has to convince him that she's just actually his mom. I think it's worth noting that the only thing that slowed down David Cornell from hacking Sarah Palin was that he didn't know how to phrase the answer to the question, where did you meet your spouse? So he tried Wazilla HS, Wazilla High School, Wazilla High. Finally, he was able to get it. But I think it's interesting and unexpected, I think deeply unexpected, that her syntax in the way she phrased the answer to the question was really the only legitimate security barrier. I also think that this starts to present a problem in interpersonal relationships, because I think we've lost sight of the importance of having unique diction and unique syntax. There was a moment in 2007 where Facebook changed their about me fields and their interest fields. I don't know if you guys remember early Facebook, back when it was called The Facebook. They just had giant boxes, and you just typed in whatever you wanted. It would say, what are you interested in? And you just write as much as you like. And somewhere around 2007, 2008, this was replaced with a kind of elaborate drop-down menu, where you know, if you're into chess, you click the chess button. If you're into playwriting, you click that button. And basically, what they did was to turn what had been a question of form, how do you express yourself? into a question of content. Tick these boxes and that's who you are. I think that this story starts to suggest to us that in fact that's a big mistake. Not only as a question of intimacy, but also as a question of security. And it really goes back to the very beginning of the field of computer science. So I'd like to rewind for a second and go back to 1950, when the British mathematician Alan Turing is considering this huge philosophical question that has hung over the field of computer science ever since which is, can machines think? Now, he answers this question by proposing this very elegant experiment, which he calls the imitation game, or as it's come to be known, the Turing test. Now, the idea behind the imitation game is that you have these three participants, A, B, and C. A is a computer program claiming to be a human. B is a human who is also, in this case, correctly claiming to be a human. And C is someone who's having these instant message, text message conversations with A and B, knows that one of them is a computer and one of them is really a person, but it's his job to figure out which. Now, Alan Turing in 1950 proposed that as a measure of artificial intelligence, a computer that could effectively pass itself off as human would, in a sense, be intelligent. It would have legitimate human intelligence. And he predicted correctly that by the 21st century, there would be computer programs giving humans a run for their money in the Turing test. What I don't think that he predicted or could have foreseen is that communication in the 21st century is a Turing test. When you get an email from a friend, you have to ask yourself, is this really from my friend? Or is this some kind of AI program that's hijacked my friend's identity? When someone posts a link for some, like, exciting pharmaceutical discount on my Facebook wall. My first action is to 
flag their account, to tell them, you know, you got to change your password. It's an annoyance, but it puts, I think, a very interesting pressure on us, which is that when I send my friend an email and I want him to click a link, I can't just email him the link anymore. I have to actually authenticate myself. And I do that by trying to speak in a Brian way. Not by giving him concrete bits of information, but just by trying to be myself and use language in the way that I use it. I think this is further complicated for us in this particular moment in history by the fact that artificial intelligence in some ways is not only the foe in the Turing test, it's also the medium that we're now in a situation where artificial intelligence is mediating human-to-human -human interactions. And for me, one of the most egregious examples of this is what's called autocomplete. <laughs> so the following graphic is from the site damnyouautocorrect.com. Someone sends a text message that says, your mom and I are going to divorce next month. What? Why? Please, call me. And he says, sorry, I wrote Disney, and the phone changed it. We are going to Disney next month. <laughs> And I think we've all had experiences like this. It's not merely an annoyance. For me, it's, it's part of something that's much deeper, which is that AI is no longer at the other end of the line, which is the, the way it is if you're dealing with spam or you're dealing with a Turing test. It's actually at our end. It's mediating the way that we interact with each other. And it's doing so in a very specific and I think a little bit of an insidious way. This is a text message that I actually sent recently. Someone was asking me how I was doing and I had had a cold that week. And so I started typing, I'm still feeling slightly ill. And you can see that my phone takes the liberty of replacing the word ill with the word aisle. I had to backspace it and, and retype it. Now my reaction to this is, I think, pretty typical, which is to say, at a, some, at a certain point, I just kind of give up. I just say, all right, fine, I'm just going to say sick. I'll just say sick. That's what the phone wants me to say, that's easier, just go with it. And I think making these kinds of concessions is extremely dangerous because it starts pushing us from a form mode of expressing ourselves, where it's about using colorful language and talking in kind of this unique way, towards this mode of pure content. They just want to know how I'm doing. Let me do it in the most economical, standard way. So I find my vocabulary shrinks. In some ways, I think autocomplete is the nemesis of literature. It poses a legitimate threat to the future of English literature, because the algorithm is based around statistical regularities in the way people speak, which means that it's going to make it much, much easier to speak in a standard way. But that's not what literature is about, and that's not what intimacy is about. It's about being different. There's this very fundamental trade-off between the efficiency that you're able to use this software. If you have an old, not smartphone where you're typing on the number pad, you're going to run into this even more so. If you use a strange word, you may literally have to scroll down 12 different synonyms to get there. And at a certain point, you just stop bothering. There's this very deep trade-off between efficiency and uniformity. And I think nothing so much as the 21st century and the Turing test and this sort of weird hovering threat of spam has persuaded us that it's the differences in speech that are absolutely critical. This is not a view that has always been held. If you go back to the 19th century, Walt Whitman in Leaves of Grass says, I am the hounded slave. I wince at the bite of the dogs. I am the fireman. I am the artillerist. All this I swallow, it becomes mine. I see and hear the whole. Now, in the 19th century, there's something kind of laudable about this. It seems like an attempt at a kind of radical empathy. Here's this guy who is just so empathic and so sensitive that he just becomes everyone, he understands everything, he sees everything the way everyone else sees it. What I think is interesting in the 21st century is that this no longer sounds like the hero of the story. It sounds like the villain of the story. You know, you look at the Borg in Star Trek, or you look at Agent Smith in The Matrix, and those are the people sort of experiencing everything as this completely one-minded collective that's all thinking and looking and perceiving alike. That no longer sounds particularly attractive to us 150 years later. You look into the history of Christianity at the Bible, Ignatius of Antioch in the year 100 AD is quoting Corinthians, and he says, May all speak the same thing concerning the same thing. Do ye man by man become but one choir? And in the Bible, we have this parable of the Tower of Babel, 
where in the beginning we're told that everyone speaks exactly alike and everyone understands each other perfectly. They build this tower that God doesn't like, and so his punishment is to create the different languages, create these linguistic differences that are going to get in the way of communication. And again, I think in the 21st century, from this perspective of online security, from the perspective of you know, what it's like to go on a speed date, we may actually be grateful that we don't all speak the same thing, concerning the same thing. To end, I'd, I'd like to come to rest on this image of Antarctic penguins, which I think in some ways are kind of the mascots for this notion of linguistic differences being absolutely critical. As you can see from this picture, penguins look basically identical. And it turns out that they basically look identical even to other penguins. And when they arrive at the nesting site, they don't arrive all as one family, they arrive separately. In many cases, there are as many as 150,000 penguins at the nesting site. So how do you find your family? Well, fortunately for penguins, they have distinct voices. And so they do it by locating the sound of their family members' voices, and they slowly start to converge through this massive crowd of people who are all doing exactly the same thing. For me, this is what modern life is like. That, in fact, we should be extremely grateful that we don't all say the same thing concerning the same thing. And I think it requires a kind of presence of mind and a willingness to stand up to your autocorrect and fight for the fact that you want to use words slightly differently than everyone else. Because I think ultimately, the opposite of identity is not impersonation, it's anonymity. And if the only way out of anonymity is having a distinct voice, then bless Babel. <laughs>